There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, aboran, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. I'm going to start talking in this video. I'm going to start talking about your CFCs again initially. So CFCs are your chlorofluorocarbons, and these CFCs were mainly used in the 1930s up to about 1980s. That's when their main use was, and they were often used as refrigerants or in air conditioning units or as propellants for spray cans. And the problem that we had when it comes to CFCs was that they were inert and non-soluble. What that means is your CFC molecules, such as the CFC11, which is the most commonly used one, or used to be the most commonly used one, because they're inert, that meant that nothing would react with them in the lower atmosphere, which meant that they could come up into the atmosphere, the stratosphere, un challenge. Right? They wouldn't be decomposed beforehand. And the other problem was the non-soluble. So rain, which obviously is quite common generally, rain itself would not wash these back down to the to the um, lower parts of the atmosphere. So both rain and normal chemical reactions didn't decompose or stop these CFCs from reaching the stratosphere. And we talked in quite a few videos already that the stratosphere was where all the problems then began. Because in the stratosphere, I completely misspelled that wrong. Oh my that is just shocking. All right, ignore that. Um, but in the stratosphere, we have the ozone layer, and the ozone layer is where we have the problem starting because that CFC will combine with UVB radiation. We talked about UVB radiation and that CVC molecule combining, and we said that we have a chlorine radical forming. That's the chlorine radical formed from this reaction. This is not the full reaction, this is a simplification. All right, so this was the actual kind of reaction in a nutshell. The sun or the UVB radiation at the ozone layer reacted with the CFC molecule. That meant that this chlorine radical popped off and this chlorine radical could then attack an ozone molecule forming this chlorine, uh, chlorine oxygen radical and an, a normal oxygen molecule. So that's how we have ozone being destroyed. And we also said that these ones, so these chlorine oxygen radicals, could then be reformed to form chlorine again, so chlorine radical, which meant that there was a chain reaction that would never stop. And we also said that there's only two possible ways that this chain reaction could stop, and those were that a chlorine radical would bump into a methane molecule forming hydrogen chloride, and a harmless radical, a harmless methane radical, or a radical that comes from methane. That's one, one way that it could stop. And the other way would be that this chlorine oxygen radical bumps into a nitrogen dioxide radic radical, and uh, not radical, but just molecule, forming a chlorine nitrate. And this is also harmless. So these were the only two ways that we can ch stop this chemical reaction, this chain reaction, from destroying all of our ozone. But we still said that one single molecule tends to destroy about 10,000, roughly 10,000 ozone molecules. So one of single CFC molecule still does lots of damage. And what we have to talk about in this video is analyze information available that indicates changes in the atmospheric ozone concentrations, describe the changes observed, and explain how this information was obtained. So three parts, or first part is kind of all in one. We talk about what happens to ozone and the evidence for that. The second part is how we obtain that evidence. So in terms of what evidence we have, we have pictures of ozone or we have sort of diagrams that show the density of ozone. If we have a density of less than 220 du, and we cover what du means, that's kind of considered to be an ozone hole. Right? So if we have a measure of less than this, we have an ozone hole. And what we found, so this is the actual year by year sequence. So you can see it always says October, and there's a reason why it always says October, and I'm going to go over that in a second. But in October 1990, the size of the ozone hole was this, this large, so this part of the ozone hole, it's over the Antarctic. But every year, it kind of got a bit bigger. And at the moment, it's, it's already past its maximum, generally what we believe to be its maximum. So you can see even every now and year, there's a strange year where the ozone hole is quite small, but generally it's getting bigger and bigger. And, but we think we've now reached the maximum. Right? So that's our evidence we have. We have sort of, we have evidence from machines, devices that we've gathered the ozone concentrations. We found that year by year, for many years, this ozone concentration at the Antarctic, so at the Antarctic, not, was quite depleted. So at the Antarctic, 
it was believed that year by year we have ozone being depleted by about 60, roughly 60% 60 of its original amount, right? So 6% of its original amount is there year by year compared to general. So this is ozone at any other part. So we have ozone, let's say over parts of Europe or anywhere else, we only have about a 3 to 8% reduction. There's a much bigger reduction at the Antarctic than there is at the ozone at other parts of the world. And I'm going to go over why, because there's a good reason why that happens as well. And we have something called an Arctic vortex. Now this is a vortex that what it does, this is the vortex here. So you can imagine like a big area, this is the vortex. And this is just above the Antarctic. So this here is the, the North Pole or the Antarctic, which is closest to Australia. And we're going to have this massive vortex. This. What does this vortex do? It makes this area extremely cold. Right? So it's very cold. And it also means that no air mixes. So this air which is in that vortex won't mix with any air outside that vortex, right? So the surrounding air won't, won't mix. Right? These two problems cause the huge hole. Another problem we have is that this initially at during, so during the winter time, so June is when winter is kind of pretty, it's high peak, there's no sun. So at the Antarctic, there's no sun during June, right? So no sun, very cold conditions, and no air mixes. What does that do? Well, we talked about these two equations in the last couple of videos. These two are equations that make sure that the chain reaction stops. These are the chain reaction stopping equations. We either have a chlorine radical forming, uh, combining with methane to form hydrogen chloride and the methane radical. This is one way we can stop the reaction. The other way would be a chlorine oxygen radical combining with nitrogen dioxide forming chlorine nitrate. In both these cases, we make sure that the chain reaction stops. There's no more chlorine radicals being there. But under the extreme cold vortex conditions, what's going to happen is here, both the hydrogen chloride is gases under normal conditions, and so is the chlorine nitrate. They're both gases right, under normal conditions. But under extremely cold conditions, it's actually going to become a solid. Right? So these two products, so I'm talking about this one here and this one here, these are now going to combine. And the reason why they combine, they would usually not combine because it's so cold. They're both solids, and when they're solids, for whatever reason, they have a big, bigger chance of combining. And that means that when they combine, we have chlorine, a chlorine molecule forming again. Right? And we also have, we have nitrous acid, which is not that important, but this is the important part. The fact that we have a chlorine molecule, it's not, not yet a radical. This is a chlorine molecule forming. Now what's going to happen next, right? So now we're at, we're at June. At the moment, there's no sun. We're at June. We have this really cold vortex, which means that we have lots of this chlorine molecules being formed out of what should have actually, so these two should have stopped the chain reaction, right? These two have stopped the chain reaction, but because of this vortex, they've combined to form chlorine molecules again. These chlorine molecules by themselves are not dangerous. Right? They're not dangerous, but as soon, whoa, 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 crazy. All right, that was my, all right, good. Um, so, but now October comes along. October means that, what's happening? Uh, October means, <laughs> October means, thank you. October means sun reappears, right? So the sun reappears. So there was no sun in June. A couple of months later in October, the sun reappears. And once the sun reappears, the UV radiation reappears again. Right? So the sun reappears. Now we have these chlorine molecules. There's going to be lots of chlorine mo molecules in the area, right? The, the actual area has mixed air with the surrounding area, so it's all trapped in this vortex, it's all trapped there. The sun reappears, and this UV radiation, what we'll do is we'll break this chlorine molecule into two chlorine radicals. And as you can see, we've got our chlorine radicals back again. And once this happens, so once October hits, you're going to see an ozone hole appearing. It's going to have so many chlorine radicals, all in a small area, which means that the biggest hole is going to be in your anoxic area, right here. So that's your major problem. And the evidence we have for that is every year during the October region, you're going to have the, the hole being at its biggest at the Antarctic region. And then once, so usually by roughly November, this vortex will be going away. So this vortex is gone roughly by November, December time, which means that the ozone 
comes back to normal, right? And air mixes again, the very con cold conditions go away, and everything returns to normal more or less. But during October every year, or the ozone hole at the Antarctic will be, right, it seems like I've got a call, um, I'm just gonna ignore it. But uh, during the Antarctic, we have the ozone hole being largest. And, what? <laughs> this is so distracting. Um, last bit is, and explain how this information was obtained. So we have this evidence, right? We have the evidence that we actually have the highest concentrations of ozone being during your different parts of October, right? always during October. And we also found that it's actually been increasing. During the 1980s, it was quite small. But after 1980s, all the way to 1990s up to now, the ozone hole has been getting bigger. And we are expecting it to be at its largest point now. So it's not going to get much bigger now anymore. But the next part is explain how this information was obtained. So how do we actually manage to find this information? Well, first, again, I want to talk about this DU, or the Dobson units. That's a measure of thickness of ozone. So 0 0.01 millimeters of thickness equals to one Dobson unit. Right, so this is the thickness of ozone. So the higher our DU units are, the thicker our ozone, the more we have. That's basically what you know about that. And you should also know that roughly 220 DU units is what we consider an ozone hole. So this is a very small amount of ozone. Usually it's about 400 to 500. So this is an ozone hole. Now we have a couple of different devices that may, may help us to measure ozone. We have UV spectrophotometers, and this is the general device or general technology we use to actually measure our ozone. But there's three different forms that they can come in. They can either be on the ground, they can be in space, in a satellite, or it can be on a balloon. So I'm going to cover each of these. All right, so let's talk about the on-ground one. So what we're going to have is we're going to have an, a station, a device, which is somewhere on the Earth at different points. And what it's going to do, it's going to point up vertically, right? So it's going to check what comes straight up. So it's going to check what comes from this part. So that if this one that located here will check this part, this one will check this part, and this one will check this part. And the idea is that it will look, so it will measure the certain UV length. So the ones that ozone usually absorbs. So it will measure the UV length that ozone usually absorbs, which is generally obviously UVB, different types of UVB wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum and it will find out how much it absorbs. So for example, let's say it absorbs a certain amount here and let's say it absorbs less here. That means that there is more UV radiation coming. So if it's less here, less being absorbed here and more being absorbed there, that means there's less ozone here. Right, so less ozone because ozone's function is to absorb UVB radiation. So the more passes, that means less ozone is there. So we check it at different points in the actual, around the globe. We check using these UV spectrometers, spectrophotometers, which are on the ground, pointing upward vertically. They're checking the amount of, of, of UVB radiation that comes to our surface. And we know that the more it comes to our surface, that means less ozone concentrations will be there at that point because ozone's function is to measure, uh, to absorb that radiation. So the more radiation we have, the less ozone we have at that point. That's more or less the gist we should get out of that technology. And we can either have it on the ground or we can have it from space. So we can have the total ozone mapping spectrometers or the TOMS for short. They are basically the same thing. They measure the same way that they measure the actual ozone, but they're, they're in space. So they're on a satellite, which means they can, they don't have to only look at one point. They can look at the whole point. So all different points around because they're always orbiting Earth. So this is a really good technology. And this is now a modern way of getting the data. Right? And this allows us to make these images. Right? These images come from actually both the vertical ones, so the ones on Earth and the satellite, but they allow us to make these pretty cool images where we can see that, the, for example, blue here would mean that it's a ozone hole. And these come from the UV spectrophotometers. Now, the last one is your spectrophotometer, which is on a balloon. Same idea, we have this device on a balloon. It will go up to the atmosphere and basically directly measure the concentrations by checking how much 
actual UVB radiation passes through the ozone hole. Remember, the more UVB radiation passes through the actual hole, what that means is the less ozone we have. Because ozone is meant to have prevented from passing, so the more that passes, the less ozone we have, more or less. That's the uh, gist of it. Um, I want to apologize for me being completely lost in this video. Like I hate when I get disturbed, I just completely zone out. So I obviously less lost my track of thought a couple times, but hopefully still got something out of the actual video. Um, I'm going to quickly cover the main points again. So we need to analyze information we have about the changes of ozone. So we've got it being kind of, so we found the data we looked at, showed that from 1980s onwards, the ozone hole always got bigger and bigger and bigger right? until about too far. We're expecting it to have peaked about 2005. And the reason why it's peaked at 2005 is because we stopped using CVCs, right? We stopped using them. We've banned them, which means we're not expecting to get much bigger anymore. But the problem is it's going to stay that big for quite some time. The reason why, remember, it has a long lifespan. It doesn't go away. So it's going to be at our atmosphere, at our ozone for a long time. So we're going to expect it to go back down gradually, not fast, even though we've stopped using them. Um, especially the CVCs completely. But the kind of peak we expect to be about 2005, 2006, of that area. We also know why, and that's why, especially the ozone is the biggest hole of the ozone is at the Antarctic. That's because of that Antarctic vortex, which has very cold conditions and it also means no air mixes. And remember what we talked about, how that makes it happen, when at least hydrogen chloride and the chlorine nitrate become solid. They form chlorine gas. Chlorine gas, as soon as the sun reappears, reacts with UV radiation to form chlorine radicals. And these chlorine radicals will then break down our ozone again. And we said that during the Antarctic, about 60% of our ozone is lost during the October period. And whereas only about 3 to 8% is lost during the other parts of the globe. But what actually happens is after the vortex is gone in November, the ozone tends to reappear again to its fullest, right? So we have this cycle having every, happening every year where the biggest loss is usually during October when the sun just reappears. And then by November, December, it, the ozone starts to reform again due to this mixing and the leaving of the vortex. We also talked about the three different types of technologies. Uh, well, the, the main sort of idea is the UV spectrophotometer. This UV spectro spectrophotometer, this measures the um, amounts of UVB radiation that come to the, the, our actual surface of the Earth or pass through the ozone. And that is a measure. So the more of this UV radiation that passes through the ozone, the less ozone we have because ozone's function is to absorb this. And we have three different devices that can help us actually measure. Uh, they have this UV spectrophotometer attached to it. It can either be on the ground somewhere on the Earth's surface it can be in space on a satellite or in a balloon. And they all do something very similar, which is to measure the thickness, which is measured in Dobson units of ozone. And remember, one Dobson unit equals about 0 0.01 millimeters of thickness. And 220 Dobson units is what we consider to be an ozone hole. So we want to have more in general. But hopefully that was useful. Thank you for watching.